Okay, so uh, our next speaker is Joe Pulitz from Brown, who's going to be talking about how to teach many more students while doing much less work than previously. Uh, Don't give it away. <laughs> yeah, it was supposed to be completely unobvious what my talk was about. The whole talk was about describing the title. There we go. Sorry for that delay. That all work. Okay. All right, so the title of my talk is Crowdsourced Conformance Testing via Remote Sandboxing. If I can explain to you what that title means by the end of the talk, I've done my job. Um, I'm Joe. So a little bit of context. In August of this year, Sriram and I opened up signups for our programming languages course for free online to anybody who wanted to do it. Uh, we should have a student in the, in the classroom if you want to raise your hand. Uh, and, uh, I'm sorry? Yeah. Okay, okay, so, and, and uh, some people were interested, so here's a map of the first thousand signups we got. We ended up getting about 1,600 signups. So people were actually interested in doing this thing. And we had to figure out how we were going to manage potentially this many people uh, in a class that's usually about 50, 50 folks. Uh, so first, let's, let's handle uh, the remote sandboxing problem. What the heck does this mean? So usually when you go to uh, grade people's programs, so we're programming languages course, so people are implementing interpreters. Uh, which are pretty full-featured programs. You have some grading script, and sort of one at a time, the grading script takes an interpreter, runs it, spits out a grade, takes an interpreter, runs it, spits out a grade. Now, this actually is a little sketchy at scale. First of all, I, doing something 1,600 times is a lot more than 50 times, but that's not so bad. I mean, computers are fast. But I trust the 50 Brown students a lot more than I trust the internet <laughs> for running like arbitrary programs on a computer I control. So I would really like it if I could just take this grading thing and, and give it to the students and have them sort of grade their own work. I mean, that seems like a great idea. It's like, you know, they're my EC2 cluster. <laughs> but uh, let's think about what I'd actually be giving them, right? So imagine if this was grade.racket, right? I, I uh, require the interpreter, so I expect them to run it in a particular directory, and it takes an argument that's the directory of tests, and then they just send us the output, and that's their grade, right? Well. Okay, well, it's a little bit too easy to casually cheat there, right? You just sort of change the number of tests you pass. So, all right, let's, let's add a report option to our testing script, all right? It's going to cryptographically sign the results of running our tests with the key super secret, all right? Okay, this is still a problem. I mean, if they're going to be able to, like, run this thing, they can just look and see stuff, right? So what's the solution, like, the software community takes here? They build binaries that actually have this stuff in them and make them a little bit harder to crack, right? At least that prevents people from casually doing this stuff. So the awesome thing about Racket is that here's the, ch here's the change that was required for me to go from the script I was using to test my reference implementation to the grading binary that we put out. Okay? We just compile this thing that dynamically requires in the student's interpreter and run the test with that. And we bundle up our tests in the binary and the key in the binary, and there's some craptography in there. I don't think this is going to stand up to a serious effort of someone trying to crack this thing, but it prevents casual cheating. People aren't, can't just change their results a little bit and submit their grade report and get a better grade. They have to do some work. And the people who have the expertise to do that probably respect us enough to do it on a little bit lower scale. Great. So what we do is we distribute this binary. We've been doing this for assignments, getting the grades back, and there actually aren't that many problems. The only things are like copy-paste errors on the JSON output. So that's remote sandboxing. We're distributing the binary and having people sandbox on their own machines, saving ourselves computation power and annoyance. Awesome. So what the heck is crowdsourced conformance testing? All right. So the first assignment we gave out to the class. So over the summer, I made up a new scripting language called Parseltongue. Uh, it's like a JavaScript-y, Python-y kind of crappy language. Uh, and I implemented a reference implementation for it. It's correct by, co correct by fiat, because I wrote it, and it does everything that Parseltongue is supposed to do. And I had the TAs <laughs> implement. We also stated that the implementation is the specification. Yes, correctly. that's right. right. <laughs> Sorry, correct by definition of specification. Right. Uh, and then I had the TAs break it in a few ways. So we had a few broken implementations, like for ran the update, update part after the test, or you course some strings instead of only taking numbers, throw out some effects. And the first assignment was write a test suite for Parseltongue 
that tickles all the bugs in the broken interpreter. So you write some test that makes sure that you get a different output uh, from the correct interpreter on the one with the broken for loop. And one that makes different output on the one that courses, courses strings into numbers than on the correct interpreter. So this was their assignment. They were supposed to write a test suite. And we gave this to the whole class. We didn't actually know how many people were going to complete this. And an amazing thing happened. They started to post things on our message board like, hey, I wrote an Emacs mode for your crappy little language. <laughs> right? I wrote a REPL for your language in Python. Here's some POSIX shell shortcuts for getting better at them. Here's syntax highlighting for Sublime Text 2. Here's PowerShell tools for the Windows users. All right? And when the, and when the submissions came in, What's that? Is that a Eclipse plugin? Uh, no, there's a geyser mode helper, though. Okay. Uh, all right, all right. He started to take the course because he wanted to track all the bug reports for geyser coming in. <laughs> all right, and, and the best one is, here. this came in after the first assignment came in. Here's the interesting part about my homework. The random program generator for parcel tongue programs. Yes. Okay. So we have over 10,000 tests for this crappy language that I wrote in like three weeks. That's just like the same amount as JavaScript. <laughs> right? Written by, so we ended up getting about 250 submissions. We didn't really get 1,600 submissions. These are the people who are sort of actually into it after they realized what we were getting them into. Right? So there's a lesson here, which is we, we had no idea this was going to happen. But somehow we managed to like crowdsource this language more than the conformance testing. I mean, every time I change the language now, I have an incredible regression suite. <laughs> but like seriously, 12 out of 10,000 will fail, oh. right? Uh, and I, then I figure out the bug. Uh, but also, we crowdsourced all the tools for the language. I, we did not expect this to happen at all. So this is sort of a value proposition we didn't know we were getting when we decided to offer an online course. And we would have picked a language that we actually wanted to use <laughs> if we had known this was going to happen. Right? We would have taken uh, you know, some student teaching language that we wanted to do this for and actually gotten something amazing out of this. I mean, this is kind of cool. I can do something with these tests, I'm sure. But that's, that's the lesson we learned from doing this. I mean, we're going to do this again and get something more out of it. So, so you planned bugs in this uh, mm -hmm. version. Did, did the 10,000 tests actually find all of them? Yes. Uh, only if, uh, a couple dozen out of the 250 actually found all 25 broken interpreters because there were a couple really pathological ones. The guy who wrote the random test suite generator found them all. <laughs> Which is pretty cool. So, so and you didn't like try to mutate. You could have done mutation generating of, of interpreters and see whether 10,000 would actually find a lot. We did it by hand so that we could give meaningful names. To uh, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. No, but it, it's, it would be interesting to see. If I break the interpreter in a bunch of other ways, yeah. do these catch it? Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Now we can, we can test now the we can quality do of the test. Yeah, exactly. yeah. Yep. yeah, yeah. I want to understand how many of these are duplicates and how many don't test anything useful and things like that. But that's you know the number of test files that there are. <laughs> yeah? How much of that community interest do you think is due to the fact that there were no tools for parcel, parcel mm -hmm. tongue, whatever you call it, right? If you had chosen some other language for which you say there existed, mm -hmm. there existed some tools, but they were crappy. Mm -hmm. Do you think you would have gotten um, a similar reaction? Do you have a, I have a response? Answer. Okay. Uh, what I told, explain to my students is this is what good software developers do. They don't sit around worrying about whether the language they work with is good or bad. They care about robot tooling because they realize whether I like it or not, I'm stuck with this stupid language for the next five weeks. So I might as well put some, invest some time up front in making it good. Right? So if the tools had already been of a good enough level that they would last for the next five weeks, I think it's all about, are, is this stuff good enough for the next five weeks? And if the crappy tools are good enough for the next five weeks, the crappy ones would have been sufficient. The ones that were not existing for the next five weeks would have been created. So that you can test this whether if, if people adopt those tools, like uh, guys are passing form, whatever it's called, uh, then, then you're right, because then people really use that. Right? They just threw out those tools and never using them again. Then maybe well, we'll never know because we have we unfortunately parcel tongue is now public. We're really sure. <laughs> we're afraid so, something might actually trigger. Well, from, from responses on the message boards, people were pretty excited about the things being posted up. So, so like this Emacs mode, are people using it? 
It, I mean, it, if the responses on the message board are an indication, it's got like a dozen and users. And people were building on top of each other. So. Yeah. Question. Yeah. So, so <laughs> yeah, go for it. The sandboxing stuff, mm -hmm. you just give them a CO file? The, the binary thing to give them. Mm -hmm. what's, what's in the binary thing? What's in the binary thing? I, uh, the, the thing that comes out of Racco distribute. So, so it's the old files. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you can decompile. Okay, so there's, there's, there's some, some. There's a little crypto. Yeah, crypto. Right there. Uh, no, that's a, that's a really foul thing from, from being secure in any way because you can, yeah. 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 Decompile yes. and get the source and. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. 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 Also, so if anybody wanted to spend time doing that, we probably had enough respect for us to not actually like publicize how they were doing it, and if they did, we'll deal with it then. So, uh, 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 one more question is. Mm -hmm. uh, how much of that ex a, a, a excited response was because the language is a toy language, not a real language? How applicable this would have been if you wanted to do it for a, a for real language? So, we, you mean how how much tool support would you get for like something that you that's said? A you said that if, that had you known that that is normally mm -hmm. so uh, overwhelmingly nice, mm -hmm. you would have done it for a real language. We would have done it for a language that we actually wanted to use. So it might be a new language that a new research language that we actually wanted yeah. to use. Like, right? oh, yeah, but not yeah. like right, like Honu or Pirate or something, right? Yeah. That's that's what we were thinking. Yeah. Is getting something off the ground, not that's something right, that's right. already. Yeah. So I got to write about two thousand test cases for Map Library. How would I go about using the racket user's mailing list to generate those? Of course. Yeah. 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 No, we're actually buying offer for grad course to spring online because we have some more work we'd like to get other people to do. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, offer a course. Offer a course. Offer a course with no merits. Yeah, or just make, talk to someone who's offering a course and make there be one assignment in the course on that. You don't have to do the whole course yourself. Okay, let's thank Joe again.